Welcome to Hive Mind. This is Edge with my co-host speaker. How are you today, speaker? Hola. I am good. <laughs> Had a couple of, couple of hours sleep, which is uh which is good for me. I'll take it. So yeah, that's lot. about that's about <laughs> on par with your usual schedule, isn't I it? I know, right? I know. Yeah. So we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm doing all right too. I'm um, just watching this political theater and shaking my head uh, at everything that's going on. You know, we have the Biden regime failing miserably on the domestic front, pretty much with oh. everything. Yeah. And since it's become more and more obvious, the same usual suspects have been kind of pe- beating the war drums lately over Ukraine to mm-hmm. divert our attention. You think that's what the, why they're doing it, to divert our attention? Well, I, I think that's that's one of the reasons. I mean, we're, we're seeing a, a mirror here, right? So you remember back in the Obama administration, uh, 2013 is where this crisis really started to kick off uh, where there was a revolution in Ukraine they asked that their, their minister there was pro-Russian revolutionary support from the south and this is where this Ukraine Russia conflict really stemmed from and we saw Hillary Clinton beating the war drums back then as well when Obama was failing on every policy except he was a very good showman so no one really cared about that um, in this case Biden's not a great showman and he's failing yeah mm-hmm. And any rational person person would think, you know, pushing for war with Russia over Ukraine would be absolutely insane. But media talking heads like Joe Scarborough and both Democrats and fake Republicans like Adam Kinzinger are becoming these full on warmongers and pushing us towards this. I thought maybe we could go through a timeline of recent events and just talk about them and what we know so far and then sort of assess why this is happening, why it's all ramping ramping up now and speculate as to where this is going to go. But I think we should kind of preface it with nobody, none of the actors in any of this are trustworthy. And so any of the information (laughs) Mm. that we have, you have to take it with a grain of salt and ask, why is this being disseminated now? You know, what narrative does it support? Who stands to gain? You know, all of these questions, right? And um, so everything that that we talk about, we have to take it all in, in that perspective, sort of look at mm-hmm. it through that lens. All right, so I'm gonna go through a kind of timeline and tell me what you think about this. So January 12th, we have found out that the CIA director, William Burns, had a secret meeting with President Zelensky and top officials, top Once Ukrainian again, officials. This is a great assault, but it, it, it's an it's interesting article to get into the, the cast of it anyway. Yeah, yeah. And this was on the same day as when the Biden regime's latest poll numbers came out, showing an approval rating that tanked down to 33% due to his mishandling of COVID and the economy and pretty much anything else he touches, okay? So same day as these tanking poll numbers on Biden, CIA directors over in Ukraine meeting with President Zelensky and top officials. And in this meeting between the CIA head and the Ukrainian officials, a narrative was formed, which was then passed on to the press and then echoed by the Pentagon and the White House. This is a typical way of dis- they disseminate information. So the narrative, which was pushed by the US intelligence community, stating that, the, that Russia was plotting a false flag operation on their own troops in order to justify an invasion in Ukraine. This was disseminated to Natasha Bertrand here, all right? Scoop, CIA Director Burns traveled to Kiev last week and met with Zelensky amid Russia's military buildup, 
a U.S. official said Burns and Intel counterparts discussed current assessments of risk to Ukraine. U.S. disclosed alleged Russian false flag plot soon after. So this false flag story was basically saying that Russia was going to uh, create a false flag on their own troops in order to justify an invasion in Ukraine. But you have to understand, this is Natasha Bertrand of CNN, the same so-called reporter who heavily pushed the Steele dossier Russia hoax false Mm -hmm. narrative. Okay, same players. That's relevant to me. All right, so do we have another Russia hoax? I think so. Um, So January 13th, so this is the very next day after the CIA director meets with Zelensky in Ukraine. The very next day, January 13th, Washington Post holds this cybersecurity symposium with none other than Dmitry Alperovich, okay, the co-founder of CrowdStrike. And as we all know by now, CrowdStrike was at the center of the Russia hoax when they claimed it was the Russians who hacked the DNC, not Seth Rich, who supplied WikiLeaks with the TNC emails. No, 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 it was the Russians. CrowdStrike was integral in the cover-up of what actually happened and attributing this hack of the DNC, so-called hack of the DNC, to the Russians. And now we have on January 13th, the co-founder of CrowdStrike discussing cybersecurity issues and the topic of Ukraine comes up. So here he is, he's talking to the host and he's explaining that we're seeing an increase in cybersecurity issues with Ukraine and that he expects the attacks will increase on Ukraine by Russia and that these attacks may be a prelude to war. And then he goes on to predict that by the end of January or early February, the war would be getting kinetic. Okay, so great foresight by the co-founder of CrowdStrike there. And what's amazing is that literally within hours on the very next day, January 14th, there was a huge hack of Ukraine's government websites, which Dmitry Alperovich had predicted within hours. Uh, So it's just amazing how these predictions by CrowdStrike uh, co-founder just happened to come true. And he just seems to be really in the loop. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're always right, right? <laughs> so, same players. It's it's like they just use the same old playbooks. Mm. And, and, you know, the same players. <laughs> also, on January 13th, Yahoo reported that the CIA has been training Ukrainian parliamentaries here in the United States for years. Yeah. Okay, so this was totally new information. It started under the Obama administration and it has continued to the present. But um, these, the U.S. is training. And okay, I'm going to read this this quote real quick here. So one person familiar with the program put it more bluntly: the United States is training an insurgency. Said a former CIA official, adding that the program has taught the Ukrainians how to kill Russians. <laughs> Okay, so since this program has been going on for years, it's interesting that now, amidst all of these other things happening, it's uh, being announced, right? I mean, here we have the head of the CIA meeting with uh, Ukrainian officials on the 12th, and then you see on the 13th and all of this information by the intelligence community community being disseminated. And uh, so it's just the timing on it really seems pretty obvious to me, doesn't it, to you? 100%. Uh, 
like I said, it's a mirror effect of what we've seen before. It's the same old playbook. And the things that, that makes this easier, though, is Russian, Russia's not completely innocent in this. This is not us being completely pro-Russia. I mean, what they're, what they're doing with Ukraine, um, there, there's a lot of republics and uh, countries that make up the Russian Federation. But it's very similar to what China's trying to do with Taiwan. Uh, it's, it's a very similar situation there. Uh, so, of course, this makes it easier. Right. These sort of things in and and invade the, the the mind of the masses. Right. I don't think Russia's innocent in any of this. I don't think any of the actors are innocent here. We just have to take the this reporting with a grain of salt and say why is it being reported now? After years, we're just now finding out that the CIA has been training Ukrainian insurgents basically in the United States for years, and it just seems very provocative to me that they're saying that, you know, these insurgents are trained to kill Russians. Um, as though it's this, this piece right here by Yahoo, of course, and you have to remember Yahoo was also very instrumental in the Steele dossier rep- Russia hoax reporting as well, Michael Isakoff uh, at Yahoo. So they have been known to push info disinfo um to perpetuate a a false narrative um but uh, not that i doubt that this story you know the legitimacy of of us actually the cia actually training ukrainian um, insurgents in the united states i'm just questioning the motives here on why this was put out now and the that particular quote in in particular being very provocative, as though it's trying to provoke um, Russia towards war, and you know, so it's not it's I'm not um, surprised at all that uh, Yahoo is disseminating this information, CNN is disseminating this information, right? It's it's all the same uh, players, all the same kind of reporters who are basically pushing a narrative that the intel community wants them to get out. And um, I wanted to play this this clip here um, by Tucker Carlson, because he kind of breaks down in this segment why the conflict is happening now, Um, namely the expansion of NATO, which is seen as a threat, obviously, by Russia. And I thought we could just listen in on this segment. It's about five minutes long, and then just talk about it, where we think things are going to go from here. Do you mind? No, not at all. Okay. Okay. One sec. So while the rest of us have been distracted by Omicron, a word that's going to be the punchline of incredibly bitter jokes five years from now, Omicron, as that has been taking up all of our disk space, the country has inexorably been moving closer to what could be an incredibly destructive war with Russia. Our media is encouraging that war. On MSNBC, the lunatics are demanding to know why Joe Biden isn't doing more to defend the territorial integrity of Ukraine. We've got to be aggressive in our defense of our allies. And Ukraine, despite what you hear from Putin propagandists, propagandists across the world, and yes, even here in America, despite what you hear, we have to defend our democratic allies. And it's time for the Biden White House to start speaking more clearly and more aggressively and telling us how they're going to stop this invasion from happening. People that stupid should not have TV shows, and they certainly shouldn't be weighing (laughs) topics like war and peace, but they are. So you have to ask yourself, why is this happening? Why are the Russians so upset? Why are we moving towards some kind of conflict? Well, there's one reason. Over a number of different administrations, the United States government has pushed Ukraine to join NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Imagine if Mexico fell under the direct military control of China. We would see that as a threat, of course. There'd be no reason for that. Well, that's how Russia views NATO control of Ukraine. And why wouldn't they? We don't get anything out of pushing Ukraine into NATO. So why are we doing this? 
Clinton Ehrlich is a Russia policy researcher. He understands this issue quite well, and we're happy to have him join us this evening. Clint, thanks so much for coming on. So is it too simplistic to say the core dispute here is over Ukraine joining NATO? I would say that that's Russia's perspective. But here we have people who are arguing that even if the Russians don't uh, invade Ukraine, that we need to invade and kick the Russians out of Crimea. That was an op-ed from a senior Obama administration official this week. Uh, and so I would say that it's even simpler than that. We're dealing with our warmongers, unserious people whose policy prescriptions could have deadly serious consequences. Well, they're deeply unserious people, and they're also people with a long and publicly available track record of failure of conflicts that have diminished the United States materially over the last 20 years. So why do they get a say in this? They're failures. They like to portray themselves as cold warriors, but the architect of America's strategy during the Cold War, George Kennan, warned that NATO expansion could lead us towards war with Russia. And he's been vindicated. We're now on the precipice of that kind of conflict. And so it's a great question. Why is it that we should listen to these people? Well, I couldn't agree more. I mean, if Max Boot is still making your foreign policy, it's kind of your fault, I would say. But, I, I, and this is a sincere question, is there something I'm missing? Is there some compelling American interest that would be served by having Ukraine and NATO. No, the, the deeper irony is that NATO doesn't even want Ukraine, that it's a corrupt country. It's more of a liability than it would be a military asset. And the people who are pushing this simply argue that it needs to happen because Russia shouldn't have a veto over who's in NATO. In other words, even when it's in our mutual interest to not have a state in NATO, we have to insist that they'll be added just to spite the Russians. Look, I want to take people seriously, all people, even people I disagree with, maybe especially people I disagree with. But this seems nuts. Is that your assessment? Tucker, it's not just nuts, it's, it's dangerous. I mean, we're sleepwalking towards conflict with a country that has more than 4,000 nuclear weapons. The, the Russians are talking about potentially deploying strategic forces to Cuba and Venezuela in a repeat of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so it's just shocking that people are not more upset about this because the lives of Americans are being threatened over a situation where we have no vital strategic national interest. So since 1945, we've really only fought wars against poor, disorganized third world countries, North Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. Do you think that that's convinced a lot of our policymakers that it's like easy to fight wars? I think that it's convinced them of that. And also, we haven't had war inside our country. The Russians have. They understand the reality of war and what it's like to lose millions of people in a conflict. And somehow, our policymakers just imagine that war can never reach us. Uh, and the reality is that you and I are in danger from this conflict, Tucker. The people that we love are in danger. Uh, and it's just incredibly disturbing that this is happening. It really is. Clint Ehrlich, I really appreciate your perspective tonight and your clarity. Thank you very much. So it appears that, you know, from all sides, there's being, uh, pre there's pressure being put to create this sort of escalation. And, and my question is, who is behind it? And by looking at kind of that timeline, it really does seem like the U.S. intelligence community seems to have their hands all over this. Do they not? Oh, yeah. But as NATO's alliances are increasing, it looks like Russia's creating alliances as well. And um, this just came out on the 18th that China, Russia, and Iran are teaming up for joint naval exercises. And they're basically saying, you know, we're going to be doing some exercises. I think it's in the uh, Persian Gulf or something. Um, hold on. Um, yeah, joint maritime drills in the Persian Gulf, but, you know, this comes after a top military NATO commander said that Iran and China will be closely watching what happens and how the U.S. handles Ukraine. So it just looks like by pushing these NATO alliances, we're actually applying pressure to create an environment where China, Russia, and Iran are teaming up and forming their alliances as well and leading towards towards war instead of de-escalation. Does it not seem that way to you? Mm, and they're the worst allies that you <laughs> Especially if China and Russia get together, then you're in for hell of a time. Well, I think that um, China and Iran appear, you know, 
to have their own objectives in their own regions with regards, as you mentioned, to Taiwan and the Middle East. But they obviously are um, watching Ukraine closely because they're looking for moments of weakness and opportunity to make their own moves as well. Right. So why? I mean, this this seems insane to be pushing this. Why would the Biden regime do it? Well, because the Biden regime is insane. Um, we've seen how unhinged this regime is. They're losing control domestically. I mean, that's why they are using all of the three LR agencies to target political opponents and voices of dissent as domestic terrorists, right? Mm-hmm. So they're losing control domestically. I think they may need, or they they think they may need a new distraction. I mean, COVID, the, the COVID narrative is dying down. People are not, are kind of waking up to all of that. And there's less fear in the population. And maybe this is a way, a new way of driving fear in the people in order to control them. And a way of projecting onto another enemy, Russia, right? Um, instead of having all of this um, hatred and anger directed towards the failures of the Biden regime, oh, we can now project all of our um, anger and angst towards the evil Russians, right? Mm-hmm. That's um, the way it always goes. Push yeah. war, find an enemy. And I guess they think that by pushing towards war, they're taking the heat off of this failing regime and putting it on Russia while keeping the general population in this constant state of fear and anxiety because that's starting to wane because the COVID narrative and everything is dying off. So, um, you know, that they need to maintain this this sense of control through fear. And maybe this is a narrative they feel like they could use uh, for that, weaponize for that against the people. But we know, um, you know, Biden's a puppet. We know um, he's been bought off by Ukrainian oligarchs and China, among many others. You know, he's weak, he's feckless, he's corrupt. So there is that power vacuum that this regime has created. Well, all of these other volatile regions and rogue actors see this as a an opportunity to make moves. What do you think? A hundred percent. Thank you on the money. So where do, you th- where do you think this is going to go? I mean, I think it could go two ways. And maybe it just stays in this stasis of, of just rumors of war. Maybe that accomplishes the desired level of fear and anxiety in the population in order to control them. Maybe hmm. cooler heads prevail and war is averted. I don't know. Um, do you well, think that's a possibility? Well, I I think that would be the number one goal is to just stoke fear, like we've seen, and US absolutely do nothing about it. Um, I I I can't see the other side happening, but if it does, it's going to create a tremendous shitstorm, and who knows where that goes from there. Right. I mean, because if it does go to actual conflict in the Ukraine. As the CrowdStrike co-founder predicted by the end of January, early February, how does he even know this? How does he have this information? Um, If it does go to that, uh, I don't think it ends with the Ukraine. As we said, you know, Iran and China are watching Ukraine closely so that they can make their own moves. And um, if this does happen, I think the outcome (laughs) of kinetic war And any of these regions, whether it's Ukraine, Taiwan, Middle East, it's all predetermined because, as we said, you know, Biden's a puppet. So he's going to do the bidding of the deep state, of China, of the globalists. So even war would just be theater at that point. Of course, it would be bloody and uh, devastating for the people, but it would be theater, in my opinion, as to drive us all towards some Uh, you know, end game, which we all know is this whole one world government agenda, right? Mm -hmm. So I just feel like it would be predetermined um, the outcomes um, of these, of these conflicts, wherever they start popping off, uh, because Biden's just going to do whatever he's been instructed 
by these deep state elements um, and rogue actors and uh, governments and regimes that that have control over him, whatever they tell him to do. But, you know, whatever happens, I think that the people need to kind of keep their eyes open, keep a level head, not be driven by fear, because I think that's their their main agenda with this narrative is the, you know, the COVID narrative is failing. So now we've got to move on to another narrative to drive fear in order to control the population. A hundred percent. And I think we need to take any reporting that we get with a grain of salt, not take it at face value because, you know, none of these actors are worthy of our trust, not the media and definitely not the intelligence community that's feeding the media this information, not the Pentagon, not Russia, not China, none of these actors, not our own government, uh, none of them are worthy of our trust. I just don't think that, in, you know, any reporting that we get, it's going to be the full story. So um, hmm. well, I guess that's my gonna... take. Yeah, we're just going to have to watch it and, and see what happens with it. But we do want to talk about it because it is something that that is being used as another an, another fear tactic, along with everything else that's going on at the moment, um, just to see how, how they um, how they go about this one. Right, but they're playing with fire here. They're playing with fire. They, they really are. And um, it's just definitely something we need to keep an eye on, but not live in fear over it and definitely not trust the narrative that we're being fed over it. 100%. All right. Well, thanks, guys, for joining us today on Hive Mind with Speaker and Edge. Please be sure to sh- share this podcast. We are on YouTube, BitChute, Foxhole, and Pilled. And we'll see you back next time right here on Hive Mind. Thank you.